Mike took pictures he shared. And that's something that's rare. He didn't just go to the occasional second line. Once he got into it, he went to every one. Mike didn't talk a lot about things. Mike did things. He was a true artist. On a mission. <laughs> Mike always got his shot. There was no veil in, in the, like, with being, being with my dad. We were on stage. I was leaning over the piano watching Professor Longhair play when I was a little girl. The culture opened up Mike's eyes. We just kept looking and, and there it was. South Louisiana is a very rich place. The exhibition at the Historic New Orleans Collection Beyond the Music is everything else that Mike photographed beyond perhaps his best known subject, that of the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival. Mike Smith did have a component of cultural anthropology in his work. He was also part folklorist, part social activist. The, uh, the exhibition here really tries to give a sense of how many things interested him. And of course, his groundbreaking work in the spiritual churches of New Orleans are, are very uh, much featured in this exhibition, as are his uh, recording of uh, Louisiana's folklore traditions uh, in New Orleans and other parts of the state. Mike loved what he was doing. He loved photography, but he loved the subjects of what he was photographing. He just always wanted to fill the frame with information. He's always very conscious of his framing. He wasn't just clicking away. It's, it's straightforward documentary work with somebody that knows how to frame the shot and how to get the shot. He never got tired going to a second line parade. He never wanted to miss a second line parade. He would come back from a Sunday second line parade after being out on the street. And you know, it can still be hot in September, October when a lot of these parades were. Throw the tapes, because he started doing field recordings too. Throw one of the cassettes on the stereo, listen to it, sit down for a half hour, and then go out to Indian practice. He was able to just sort of you know, like fold himself into these, these parades, these, these you know, fluid, active groups of people, and you know, not be in the way and not be no line. And that's, that's a hard thing to do too, to like be in the middle of a group of people who, you know, are like, you know, dancing or playing music with, you know, complete abandon. If he had to climb to the tallest pole to get his shot, that's what he would do. If he had to, you know, get way down on the ground with some of the second line shots, that's what he'd do. He always got his shot. He didn't care how he looked. He didn't care how he dressed. People eventually sort of accepted that. Come as you are. They'd tell him in the spiritual church, don't be embarrassed about the way you're dressed. Mike, come as you are. There was nothing for Mike to go the wrong way down a one-way street or, or park where he wasn't supposed to park because, you know, he was on a mission. <laughs> and Mike, I mean, he was sort of an evangelical in, in that way. I mean, he had that zeal. He was a true artist and was absolutely driven by his love and his need to document what he called, uh, you know, the, the unique cultural wetlands of the inner city. He was the one, I think, who, at least the first person I ever heard, conceive of the, the clubs and the parade groups um, as, you know, constituting this term he, he coined, the cultural wetlands, because he said that before they were headliners, um, or before they took this type of music you know, to the big stages, they were playing in clubs or street corners and on these streets. It was you know, the cultural wetland. He was, he was always chasing authenticity, chasing that alive moment of creativity. People outside of our city were unaware of some of these rituals. When those rituals became known, of course, African American and European and Asian and you know everybody's everybody's oh my God, something authentic and real. Let's all let's all jump in and and, and, and capture this. He had started in the mid mid '60s photographing for the Tulane Jazz Archive. I think that was a job. In 69, two of the greats in the jazz world died, clarinetist George Lewis and the drummer Paul Barbaran. And Mike covered both of those. He started doing that and then going around black neighborhoods and seeing these churches that were spiritual churches. So he got involved in that. 
and then he noticed the connection to Mardi Gras Indians, how people were in the same thing. You know, Jolly might be the, the uncle of the Neville brothers, but he was chief of the Wild Chapatulas. And then he played Tuesday nights for a while at Tipitina's. It was all interconnected.